This is Podkit, episode 52, Untitled Podkit Game, on Saturday, September 28th, 2019. And now, we forgot to pick a title. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk52. So, did you guys hear about that goose game? I did hear about that goose game. What? Honk. Ah. The goose game is really great. Um, so, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, a game that's been kind of uh, long awaited uh, called Untitled Goose Game was released last week. Uh, it's made by uh, a really awesome uh, software house with kind of a long history of building really awesome Mac software called Panic that we've mentioned on the show many times before. And an Australian, I believe Australian, um, game studio called House House. And basically, it's kind of it's kind of the best thing because you just walk around this town as a goose and, um, you know, mess some stuff up, make people's lives miserable. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. You give you some to-do lists and you just kind of go through, knock each item off the list. And when you're, when you're done, then you just get to be a goose. It's a pretty fun, uh, pretty fun setup. Um, I got to play this game at XOXO last year, uh, when they were just demoing an early version of it. So it's really cool to kind of see it, um, live and out there in the world. I, I haven't finished the game yet, but it's kind of one of those things that feels pretty, um, pretty nice to dig into and uh, and kind of play for some time. Do either of you guys have it? No, I bought it uh, last Friday when it was released, and I played through like a level or two, and I still have to play through the rest. I'm not that great at video games. I had to search for a tutorial on YouTube how to finish the tutorial. So yeah, but I anticipate playing more soon. I feel your pain. And uh, to, to quote a tweet I saw that I don't know where the source is anymore, in Minnesota we call it the Untitled Grey Duck Game. Ah, yes. Never forget. For those out-of-towners, in Minnesota we don't call it Duck Duck Goose, we call it Duck Duck Grey Duck. So uh, apply that to Untitled Goose Game, and there, there you go. Exactly. So I didn't know what this game was until a few days ago when we were talking about it at lunch. Zach has been playing this game and he loves it. Of course. Yeah, you kind of have to love it. It's the best. I mean, just what a concept. You're just a goose walking around. I've I've heard some people describe it as like Hitman or Grand Theft Auto, but you take all of the um you know, kind of violence out of it. I mean, all well, the goose can still kind of perpetrate some some kinds of violence, I guess, but you know, it's it's like a similar sort of game of stealth and uh you know strategy and wreaking havoc um but you know in just like this very different and kind of absurd context which makes it pretty pretty darn fun there's another game i played for the switch that's kind of like this called party hard where basically you play as a um disgruntled neighbor who goes around to your neighbor's parties and like starts you know breaking things um you know messing messing with people that one's maybe a little bit more gruesome, but, um, it's, uh, it's another really good and interesting game in the genre of like, you're kind of sneaking around, messing stuff up and using that as a, as kind of a source of entertainment. So it's fun, it's fun stuff. I know Zach's a pretty big fan of it. You're saying Ryan. Yep. Um, I still have, I'm only on the second kind of level, the second to do list. So I've got a little ways to go yet, but it's, it's fun stuff. Well, cool. I think beyond that, um, we should also chat about some new uh, iPhones that were released recently. That's right. Um, did you hear about those new iPhones? I sure did. I sure did. Um, I might get one, believe it or not. The yeah, the weird one with the three the fr- the three cameras. Um, the Pro. Yeah. The problem is, I I've tried to go to the Apple Store probably on three separate occasions in the past two weeks, um, and every time they don't have something they don't either don't have the right finish they don't have the right storage or um or both um rosedale doesn't seem to have any but uptown seems to have some sometimes and southdale for whatever reason seems to always have pretty much everything but i'm not going to go to southdale under any circumstances because that's like the wrong side of the universe for this kid um it's not that far 
yeah, but it's the it's the emotional toll of of going on that side of um, what's the freeway four ninety four three ninety four six ninety four one of those sixty two. To be honest, sure. going that way is fine. It's c- coming back this way ever. That's impossible. Yeah, yeah. I've, yeah. That that stretch of that stretch of freeway is like cursed. Everything bad that's ever happened to me in a car has happened on that stretch of the freeway. Basically, yeah, that's fair. So I just, I, it's superstitious, but can't do it. Can't do it. So Brian and I recorded uh, Nexus Special 66 to talk all about those new iPhones. You know, I, I thought that a whole announcement was better than usual. Um, and I think for me, the the marquee bettering feature was that they actually lowered the price of the uh, regular 11 iPhone because it's basically a 10R, but it's just uh-huh. new now. So I thought that made the whole thing even a little bit better. Uh, while a ton of people were complaining about how this was the most disinteresting keynote in years, which is surprising to me. I thought it was fine. Like, yeah, whatever. There, It's another keynote. I wouldn't expect the world, and I wouldn't be disappointed that easily either. So it's, right. it's just kind of a thing now. It's not the hypiest, hypey event ever. I don't yeah. know. They've kind of toned down a little bit. But that's fine. Their supply chain is huge. Things are going to leak, and it is what it is. Anyway, Brandon, I heard you got a phone. Ha, sure did, and it's not an iPhone for once. I've what? been trying to debug this strange issue that seems to only uh, afflict certain makes and models of devices uh, in the Android ecosystem. Uh, so I managed to pick up the cheapest, viable, most frequent uh, device that has uh, this issue, and it's a Motorola G7. Um, and, uh, I'm actually kind of excited. It's, you know, kind of a lower end phone, but, uh, it's nice to have a, it's nice to kind of have that context, especially when you're building hybrid mobile apps with Flutter and React Native and stuff like that, because a lot of times that's where you're running into a lot of the issues, right? Which is probably why we're having this particular kind of bug that I can't replicate on my other hardware Android device or other Android devices I borrowed from other people because, frankly, the the ones that I have are all kind of like flagship Android devices. So it's possible there are resource constraints that I'm missing. So it should be should be good stuff. And also the thing was like I think $137 when I bought it open open box, which is not not too shabby for a unlocked, you know current android phone or phone from any manufacturer yeah yeah i i have had uh i had the first moto g my my parents had had different moto g's over time my mom had a moto g5 plus Mm -hmm. until recently when she switched to the pixel 3a the moto g line was originally kind of like this second tier nexus line until Motorola sold themselves off to Lenovo, and now it's just kind of a joke line. Yep. But it's kind of funny to think about the G7 as sort of a low-end phone when, um, spec-wise, from Qualcomm, Qualcomm would say that this is a mid-range phone because there are the the Moto E line, which is, has even worse processors and RAM amounts. So Right. It's always funny. You can always get worse. Yeah, that's that's true. That is kind of the story of the Android ecosystem in a lot of ways, isn't it? But should be interesting. Um, so I'll I'll probably have some have some thoughts about that that I'll tweet out for sure. Uh, speaking of new acquisitions, though, Brian, I heard you got a new watch. Is that true? I did. Got the Apple Watch Series Five, uh, forty-four millimeter, aluminum, space gray, with a. A uh, sport loop band that I don't remember the formal name, but it's kind of a blue with yellow on the outside. It's quite I nice. Say it was like Australian blue or something. Yes, I, yeah, no? something. Yeah, I don't remember something blue or Alaskan blue or I don't know. Oh yeah, it was some, some like place. Yeah. Anyway, so I have that. It's been going pretty well. Uh, I have always on display. Yeah, how is the always on display? Is it wonderful? It's nice. I can glance at it quick. So I decided with the larger screen, I would start using an analog watch face. So it is a little slower for me to like read the time real quick because I've been using digital watches my whole life mm. or watch faces. So I'm trying to make that conversion because the larger screen with the rounded corners uh, allow for more complications on a screen that the previous Apple watches didn't let you have, at least with analog display. So, 
Yeah, it's pretty good. Battery life is worse than my Series 3, but that's kind of expected with the always on display. Really? I uh, heard I heard a couple of people mention that battery life thing. How much worse do you think it is? Um, battery life is pretty good, but uh, if I forget to charge it overnight, I'll need to charge it the day after, where my Series 3, at least at first, I could get through two days pretty consistently with like mm-hmm. a mile and a half walk workout each day. Um. So yeah, it's uh, it's definitely worse, but that's fine. I think if I'm doing something like crazy, like doing the MS150 or traveling, then a super long day, and I won't really have a great time to charge my watch. I'll turn off the always on display. But mm-hmm. for general casual stuff, I've heard there are terrible battery issues. Um, like Casey Liss has mentioned this on ATP and on Twitter. Right. Um, but I think that sounds like a cellular Apple Watch thing, and maybe iOS 13. Uh-huh. I have the GPS only version, so I'm not really seeing huge problems. So I don't know what the deal is. But yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I, I've heard that iOS 13 overall has been sort of um, bumpy. So yep. I well, I got the iOS 13.1.1 came out yesterday. So they've been fixing some bugs, adding new features, fixing security holes, etc. All right. Nice. Well, I did not buy anything this week, um, but I'm still hoping for that new MacBook Pro. Uh, There are still still rumors and still hope for this new MacBook Pro, uh, allegedly coming later later this fall. Later, allegedly. We'll see. Allegedly, production of this new product has started, which means there could be a launch in October or November. Ha. Do you think? Do you think it's going to replace the current MacBook Pros, or like how does that work? Because they just updated them. I think it's a new a, a line above, but yeah. I don't know. It could be the MacBook Pro Max. That could be what they call it. The MacBook Pro Max Super Retina XDR. Will they spell it M A C S or M A X? Oh my goodness! Who knows? Yes. Or Max? Ha. MacBook Pro. Yeah, I don't know. Uh I, I wouldn't be surprised if they call it... Well, they already have Pro, don't they? I think it'll just be a new Pro with a higher price range, and they might do that weird thing where they sell multiple versions for a couple of years, and the old version hangs around longer than it should, mm-hmm. Yeah, et cetera, et cetera. I just hope it's good. It needs to be really good. I need a, I need one. Um, another new thing in Apple News, uh, a jailbreak for the iPhone 4S through iPhone X... At the boot ROM level, which is a read-only bit of memory, which means it's locked in hardware, was released a day uh, yesterday, Friday, I think. Um, we haven't seen a uh, exploit or vulnerability like this since the iPhone 4 in 2010. Wow. Um, I think this is using um, a security hole that um, some like um, spyware companies that are you know sell software to spy on people's phones that a lot of governments might use. Um, for criminal cases and things, um, have been exploiting th- that this vulnerability for these iPhones. Um, so this means that um, you can kind of inject things at the boot process for any iPhone over USB for any iPhone 4S to 10, and this kind of means every iPhone up to the iPhone 10 is now has there's some exploit that can be capitalized for that, and that will span across new versions of iOS that run on the iPhone 10, for example. So the 11 isn't. Um vulnerable the 10s and the 11 are not correct well, the 10s good. added um um some new security features in the 812 processor and the 813 has those as well as probably more that have really locked down the processor um but this was um i think a race condition in some boot process thing it's not the most reliable it sounds like you kind of have to try it a few times for it to hook uh, I probably won't be jailbreaking because I'm kind of done with that years ago, but I follow people on Twitter and I find it fascinating. Yeah, this is a pretty wild thing to find, I feel like. It's, it's not always, uh, you know, it's it's not it's not great. I don't love it. Um, and especially, you know, with all, with all of the kind of, um, you know... Uh, the the really the industry that's kind of sprung up around like um selling this like jailbreaking technology developing it and then selling it to like 
governments is kind of not great. I don't, I don't love it. I feel like there are lots of problems with that. Um, but it's really fascinating that folks discover this stuff, right? And I guess it's amazing that people discover this. I'm really glad that like we know about it now. Like that's cool. I'm a fan of that part. Yeah. Um, some of the the comments um, in this um, thread that I'll link in the show notes on Twitter um, kind of say that. While, you know, it's something that in private has been used to break into people's devices and things, uh-huh. um, releasing it to the public now just kind of levels the playing field. So people can use it for security research as well and not have to kind of hoard private vulnerabilities and things right. as much. So they can use this to debug. So, you know, Apple um, at Black Hat, I think it was a few weeks or months ago, announced that they'll be releasing some developer devices to do security research on. And this kind of allows you through not, you know, as sanctioned means, but at least allows developers who are interested to investigate the iPhone and hopefully report bugs and make it more secure. I mean, I'm sure this will be used for nefarious means too, but as an owner of a 10s i'm kind of exempt so that's okay for my security <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> well so so that i think that's a critical point too so as far as apple's concerned you know it's it, it's a bummer that you know eight and above are vulnerable but anybody who's using older than that should kind of move on now but more broadly than that i don't i presumably you have to be doing this over usb so you need physical access, and anybody would argue that once you have physical access, you've lost anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. And it, it's a, a thing. You have to get into DFU mode on an iPhone, so you, you turn it off, and then you turn it on with a specific key shortcut. Um, the root file system is still encrypted with your passcode, but you can kind of do some brute forcing with that. If you don't have the... Um, maximum of 10 retries before wiping the device so there's still some protection you can do around user data right. but um you know still getting hardware access at that low of a level it allows for a lot of things totally well i think that uh wraps up the apple section of this episode uh now it's time to talk about the react section of this episode those are the only two things we can talk about here that's um, that's the podkit way hey brian what's hey, coming ryan. Oh, later this year. Uh, later this month is React Conf on October. Uh, I think it's twenty uh, fourth and twenty fifth. Yeah, in in outside of Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, none of us will be going, but we put our names in for the raffle. I believe yeah, every, all of us. So did. unlike ATP, where every single one of them somehow figures out how to win the lottery, none of us won the lottery. It's weird how that happens. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder. Hmm. But um, yeah, so uh, they've released the speakers. There's some great speakers up there. Um, some, it looks like one or two talks maybe that I saw at React Rally, which is awesome that they're getting another stage to present on. Um, and as well as um, a couple of talks by people who work on React at Facebook. Um, Andrew Clark on a tweet in September 20th um, was replying to someone talking about, um, you know, async stuff with React. And he's like... Um, and then Sophie Alpert said, what happened to batched mode? And Andrew Clark says, hmm, maybe there's some event coming up in the next month or so where we can share it with everyone. So I I would like to think that um, concurrent mode will be released at least in an alpha build of React uh, by the end of the month. Um, we'll see. They've been working on it for three years, at least in discussions and implementation. Uh, and they just yesterday released React 16.10 with um, what looks like to be kind of a more minor release, um, fix some bugs and things like that. But they um, did improve some performance and change up their scheduler a little bit, which is, they say, is experimental. Um, That's probably all tied with concurrent mode or whatever they're calling it these days. And um, some fix to use subscription, which looks like it was tied to concurrent mode as well. So... The preparations are in place. Yeah, it seems like the 1610 release is so that when, you know, later this month they release the the secret thing, whatever it is, it can be built on 1610.alpha29 or something. Yeah. 
well, and and it's not secret at all. The secret thing. Yeah. Um, at least I'm I'm more involved in the community than I was when hooks were announced a year ago. Uh, so I'm very much aware of this. Where hooks were like, what is this? I don't know if that was done in more secret than before. Oh, that was done in total secret. Yeah. So th- this this has been like the thing for years now. So yeah. What else was updated this week that it's sort of important in the React community? React Router 5.1. Whoa. Now, for for everybody at home, what happened to like what what is what happened to 4? What happened to React Router 4? So, React Router 4 um was was a thing. Uh Ryan Florence and Michael Jackson of React Training, they build React Router released uh Reach Router, which has a different API than React Router. And then they, after a while, are like, let's merge them back together. Because I think React Router is by far much more popular. Um, but they had a, a place to discover some new ideas and new APIs in Reach Router. So version 5 kind of uh, at least started by... Um, how do they do it? What was in 5? I think 5 was originally released as React Router 4.5. But there's a peer dependency change that made it a breaking. Yep. But React Router 5.1 releases a hooks API to uh, use router state or router stuff. So there are a few hooks they have released. So things like use params, which lets you get things out of the old match prop if you rendered a route with a component or a render prop. Um, that's, that gives you match params, match slug, or, or no, not slug. That's an example. Uh, that would be a, an example of a match param. Um uh, Match URL, match path. Um, they also have uh, use location, which gives you that location object. So you can do location.path name or any of those location.hash, things like that. Uh, they have a use history hook, which returns the history object. So you can do things like history.go back and go back a page. This is wonderful. We have waited how many years for this? Uh, oh, less than almost nine months. One. Less than nine months, but um, it's felt like years. It felt like years, and i I've always I've always had this weird relationship with uh, React Router because, on one hand, I love the React flavored declarative routing, but on the other, getting at the data in the router has been so hard. And you you, you have to yeah. pass things prop drill or use header components, or just use route components everywhere, and just the worst thing that you could do is shove your router data into redux and now who knows what's going on right yeah that uh connected react connected react router or react router redux there's yep. a library called or a couple of libraries called that that, that, you do that. i never went all the way in because i kind of believe that the router should drive everything about what is rendered in the application and so um the app i work on at work is we try to do our very best to make it everything very deep linkable Yep. So we have lots of routes that, um, you know, conditionally render this and that, um, and lots of redirects. So we don't, you know, have all these undefined behaviors and can in the future add stuff in the middle in ways that it currently is not doing. I think that's the way to go. And I think a lot of this new hook based capability will clean up a lot of that code because I, I've seen my fair share of messy react router code and this will help. I'm definitely hoping at least for my app at work, we can get some priority to, go through our application and rip a bunch of stuff out, you know, only use the route prop for rendering children components and then let those children use hooks to grab the data. Well, and of course they say that they're working on version six already. So uh, get ready for a completely breaking API change later, later next year. Yeah. They're, they're working on uh so they say use history hook is a quick stop gap for a future hook that they're working on called use navigate and that'll provide an API that's uh, more closely aligned with the link component and will fix a few long-standing problems with using the history API directly in the router. Um, it, they say it'll look a lot like reach routers navigate API, which I know nothing about. So that'll be interesting to learn about. Yep. Uh, there's also a use match route hook, which let's see, that kind of returns uh, match data and um, will help you do things where you maybe had done a route with a render prop where you would render one thing or another thing, so kind of conditional stuff, and use route match will kind of return a match boolean that's true or false, or truthy, falsey. And so you can kind of do this check more in JavaScript versus in 
weird JSX thing. So yeah. it's a little more pure for JSX is more your presentation and let you do your logic before the return statement in, in a component. This is great. Big fan. About time. Yeah, we are already investigating using this in my app at work. Uh, I read this blog post and was like posting in Slack, like, "Oh my God, this is us! This, this, this!" And yeah, I'm I'm excited. This nice. is kind of the the one last library that I use a lot that didn't have a hooks API, and I'm very excited. Perfect. Hey, Brandon. Hi. Do you know what time it is? I wonder if it's new Twitter followees time. I think it is. Well, golly gee whiz, I'll start off then. Perfect. Um, I found three amazing new people I followed this week, including um, Nala Games, N-O-L-L-A Games on Twitter. Uh, And I follow these folks because, um, oh my goodness, what did they make? They made Baba Is You, which is another of my favorite Switch games. And they just released a new game called um, Noita, N-O-I-T-A. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. They're all like Finnish folks, so I'm I I my silly American vocal cords are not conditioned to making sounds in Finnish. Um but Baba is You is another really awesome kind of puzzle game. Um and uh that these folks are still making stuff is super cool. So that's thing number one there. Uh thing number two is Big Endian Smalls. Um, who is a security researcher who I believe was tweeting about the iOS, um, the iOS vulnerability that Brian discussed earlier on here, um, and is uh, kind of a cool person who converses with Ian Coldwater, friend of the show, Ian Coldwater, among other folks. Um, so that was uh, another cool person I followed. And last but not least is Alliance A double L double I A N C E which is uh, kind of an interesting non-tech follow that I've added because they actually do architecture for airports, Um, architecture and interior design and all that stuff. And they have some really cool, intricate like case studies where they talk about their method. And I just really love that. I love reading about that stuff from other disciplines. So that's kind of why I added those folks in here. And that just about does it for my new Twitter followees. Nice. Uh, I followed a few people, but uh, let's start. I, I narrowed it down to three, as we like to do here, but sometimes, like last month, I did not. Uh, the first is Get Cute Podcast. Um, this is a great podcast that um, they're not too long episodes, they're like 20 minutes. Um, um, it's kind of talking about the software engineering world at large um, and getting started with um, topics. Um, that might pertain to a new developer or just someone in the middle of their career or whatever. Um, it's, um, it's a good one. I would definitely take it, uh, for a spin and give it a listen. Cool. Uh, next up is Andy Fleener. Uh, he is on the platform operations team at sports engine. I saw him give a talk about, uh, being on call at sports engine for DevOps Minneapolis a couple weeks ago while I was on call. So it's kind of fun to go to that while I was on call. What? Um, so meta. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I've, I've seen him around on Twitter, so I give him a follow too, since I've seen him talk. And last is uh, Charlie Gerard. Um, she is a front-end dev at Atlassian and other other places. Um, yeah, just another uh, JavaScripter to follow on the large Twitter sphere that is JavaScript developers. Um, nice. She's got some good good thoughts around um, what she's been working on. Um, I don't follow people regularly on Twitter, so uh, I've got nothing for you. Perfect. That's all right. That's how it goes. Uh, so I balance out Brian and Brandon, so like they can follow everybody and I can follow nobody, so then they can just do that. That works. There's like a variation of that terrible meme on Facebook that like their hands look like this, so mine can look like this. Right? Have you all seen this? I don't use Facebook, so no. No, I'm I not sure what you mean. What? I'll 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 post this because it's it's very terrible. Um, it's like a variation of the like here. I'll just put the know your meme link in there. Um, but it's a picture of like um, you know, uh, apparently the husband's hands and they're all dirty or something, and then the wife's hands are like manicured and pretty. 
So the joke, the bit that I was trying to make is that your Twitter followees look like yours do, Ryan, so that ours can look like ours do. Yes. <laughs> I agree with uh, you. I see. There you go. That's the bit. <laughs> That's the bit. That's what I, I – and now I have thoroughly explained the memes, so there's no point. <laughs> oh, no. That's all right, though. Now I see the Know Your Meme link, so I must actually look at it. Okay. Uh, and, uh, nope, I don't want to whitelist this for ad blockers. <laughs> Thank you, Know Your Meme. And the image is 404-ing oh, or no. something else. Oh, there Uh-oh. I see it. Yeah, I've never seen that. Um, interesting. Yeah, that sounds like very Facebook meme. Man, we just talked about that for like four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, what are you guys doing next week? That's a great question. I have to look at my calendar. What am I doing? That's like, yeah. Uh, let's see. Next week. Um, nothing Nothing too too special, it looks like. Um, I don't know. Working. Yep, me too. Hanging out. Trying to stay busy. Seeing people. Doing things. Going to coffee shops. I'll be editing this episode this week. That's, that's what I'll be doing. Perfect. And I can tell you what I will hopefully be doing at some point, which is playing around with Svelte a little bit. Um, oh, cool. At JavaScript Minnesota last week, um, we had Andy Tatton give a talk about Svelte, and it was awesome. He gives wonderful presentations and high energy, great volume, super thorough. Uh, so I will be linking the YouTube video if you are interested in that. Um, yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah, that was a good talk. One of our... Um, one of our... I don't know, like one of our projects at work, it uses Svelte. It's used uh, Svelte 1, so it's kind of legacy Svelte now. But it's, um, you know, people like it. People think it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, Next weekend, or in just a few days, in other words, uh, on October 5th, I will be going to the Kotlin Everywhere Twin Cities Talk at the uh, Best Buy campus. And I'll be listening to a bunch of people talk about Kotlin, and that'll be a lot of fun. That'll be cool. Yep. Nice. Got to gotta get something other than Java uh, going because nobody likes Java. Only in the morning in a cup, in a, in a in a mug. This is true. Yep. So Java's only good in the morning in a cup and Kotlin is good everywhere. Ha, I see what you did there, Ryan. I see <laughs> what you did there. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, um, let's see. Uh, what's what's next? Where Where can we find you on the internet here? Ryan, take us away. Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially at Twitter at Ryan Amar, and of course on my website RyanRamperset dot com. And it's uh, it's the same website; haven't updated in a while. It's good though. Nice, Brandon. Where can we find you? You can find me just about everywhere, but mostly on Twitter, where I'm Brandon underscore MN, or Instagram, where I'm also Brandon underscore MN. I've been feeling a little under the weather recently, so I've been cooking quite a bit, um, which means that there's lots of ridiculous food pictures on Instagram. Um, and that's probably where I've been posting most of my content recently. There you go. Otherwise, nice. you can find me at coffee shops around Minneapolis. Yeah. How about you, Brian? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, brianm.me, where I have a new table on the bottom of that front page that says the top artists I've listened to in the last month on Last.fm. So that was fun. I built it with vanilla JavaScript and a, just a fetch call. Uh, it's not transpiled at all, so it's not going to work on old browsers, but hooray, last couple of years of newer ones should be fine. Yeah, we don't need to support those old browsers anymore. It's over. Actually, I will be at coffee shops this month working on Hacktoberfest. That's another thing we should probably plug. Oh, goodness. That's what's coming up this month. Yeah, I will be trying to submit some pull requests for some open source libraries I'll, I'll say it here, so maybe I'll hold myself accountable to it. I would love, so I use React Placeholder at work. But that works on React 0.14 all the way through the current version of 16, but it doesn't use the uh, – it uses component will receive props and some other stuff that is deprecated now, and so it's throwing warnings. And I would love to just drop support for everything below, like React 16.8.6 or something like that. So I would love to update that and make it modern and maybe fix some TypeScript types that broke recently. So I might be doing that. That would be perfect. Like a fun, a fun rewrite the thing in TypeScript. That might be what I try doing. Who That'd knows if it'll be accepted? But I'll at least submit a pull request. I hope. You can, you can do it. They'll take it. Yeah. 
Uh, oh, and also on my website, there's now brianm.me slash secret dash Santa, which is at least the start of a UI for a secret Santa UI that wraps my gift exchange package. Um, and I'm testing out a alpha version of React Form by Tanner Lindsley. Um, so that's been kind of fun, too. And I need to keep working on that to make it look better, perform better, and allow you to add exclusion logic, which the library supports, but my UI doesn't yet. Lots of stuff. Woohoo. So cool. Perfect. Well, and you can find the show notes for this episode at the nexus.tv slash PK52. And you can leave comments for us. You can uh, tell Brian all about your open source contributions uh, later this month on reddit.com slash r slash the nexus TV. And you can support us by going to patreon.com slash the nexus TV. And you can uh, even receive a special limited time only coaster if you would like. I used all four coasters I got last week the day I got them. Pretty cool. I went to, uh, yeah, have have a drink with some people after JavaScript Minnesota. And I'm like, well, instead of a, a napkin, let's use coasters. Yeah, they're, they're pretty fancy. They, they do their job. They're great. Truly iconic. Well... I think we're good. And until next time, have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.